Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast. I'm your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and it's been a while since I've been on the podcast, but it's good to be back, and if you like the show, I hope that you might take just a minute and subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps boost the show, make it to where more people can find it and see it. Um, you can also find me on my Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is at Methodical Pod. So be sure to check me out. I'm excited to announce that I've written a new Lenten book entitled Palms, Passion, and Resurrection, Holy Week According to Mark's Gospel. Uh, the book is designed to be a devotional resource for those who are seeking a deeper connection to God in the Lenten season. In each chapter, we journey with Jesus through the events of Holy Week according to the Gospel of Mark. As we walk alongside Jesus during Holy Week, we bear witness to the Passion story. We join the crowd's praises during Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We witness Jesus cleansing the temple, overturning the tables, and driving out the money changers. We listen to Jesus' teachings in the temple as he addresses some of the religious leaders' questions. We smell the oil that is poured on his head during his anointing. We sit with Jesus at the table alongside the disciples in the upper room during the Last Supper. We pray with Jesus as he agonizes in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he is betrayed and arrested. We watch helplessly during Jesus' trial, crucifixion, and death on the cross. Ultimately, we celebrate Jesus' victory over death through the resurrection. Palms, Passion, and Resurrection is now available on Amazon and ParsonsPorch.com. I'd love for you to check it out and leave a review. So I have been wanting to do a podcast about forgiveness for a while now because I think that this is something that a lot of people struggle with, myself included. Um, forgiveness is quite possibly one of the hardest things that we do as human beings. The need for forgiveness is a universal topic that affects everyone, everywhere. Um, all ages, all places, all spaces, everyone has dealt with this theme of forgiveness in their lives, um, often on a daily basis. It's a, it's a big topic, and it's in, um, a very central theme in Scripture. In the Gospel of Matthew, we see an encounter between Peter and Jesus about this very topic of forgiveness. And I want to kind of begin the podcast today looking at that story as our framework. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. I'm going to read this now. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he should be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned, to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged to him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you the tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. That's what my Heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. This passage reminds me of a story about a father and son in Spain who had a terrible argument. The son Pedro, nicknamed Paco, ran away. His father looked everywhere trying to find a son. He searched for many months without any success. 
Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in a local newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. That Saturday, 800 young men with all but the nickname Paco showed up, looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. There's something deep within us that longs for this kind of reconciliation and forgiveness in our relationships. There is something divine about this practice of forgiveness, but it's still so incredibly difficult to navigate. In the passage that I just read, we see that Peter goes to Jesus and asks him, Lord, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Peter is essentially asking Jesus, how often do I have to forgive somebody that has wronged me? Is seven times good enough? Uh, This begs the question, is there somebody that Peter has been wronged by? When Peter asks this question, is there someone that he has in the back of his mind that he knows that he should forgive? If so, is he tired of forgiving that person? Um, It makes you think, is he at the seventh time of forgiving somebody that has wronged him? And, And maybe this is something that we can relate to. Maybe we have asked that question of ourselves. When can I stop forgiving somebody who has repeatedly offended me and wronged me? Um, Have you ever uttered the phrase, I am done with her, or uh, he is dead to me, or I'm not wasting my time on them anymore? We often uh, want to put a limit on our forgiveness, like Peter. Is seven times enough? I feel like I've given you know, a fair shake to this person, but I'm done now. But Jesus responds possibly to Peter's dismay and probably to our dismay as well, that we are supposed to forgive people not seven times, but 70 times seven. And it seems that Jesus speaks to the importance of forgiveness because he knows the effects that unforgiveness has on us. Unforgiveness breeds resentment and anger and bitterness And that often, usually, only hurts us in the end. It's kind of like Yoda says, Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. That's for all those Star Wars fans out there. And to kind of illustrate this idea, Jesus dives into a parable on the theme of forgiveness. In this story, a servant that owes just an outrageous sum of money is brought before the king, and it's clear there's no possible way that this servant is going to be able to pay these debts back. And the king's first reaction is to sell the servant and his family, his wife and children, sell everything that he has, and this strikes fear into the heart of the servant, and he begs for mercy. He gets on his knees, he says, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything back. And the king, he hears this, he has pity on the servant, and so he releases the servant and just forgives him of all these debts. And then the servant goes out, and he comes across a fellow servant who owes him just a small sum, a hundred denarii. And so the servant, who had just experienced this amazing act of mercy and forgiveness, decides to grab his fellow servant by the throat. He demands payment. The fellow servant falls to his needs and pleads to him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you everything back. But the servant who had just been forgiven looks at this other servant and refuses to have patience and refuses to forgive him of his debts. And so he has him thrown into prison until he can pay his debt back. And there's other servants around, and they're watching all of this happen. They're clearly upset, so they go to the king. They tell him what's happened. The king hears. He's completely outraged. He's like, you're an evil servant. I forgave you this huge sum because you begged for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to others, to your fellow servants who ask you for money? The king is so furious that he forces this man to pay back his entire debt. And then Jesus ends with this harsh warning and says, that's exactly what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally to anyone who asks for mercy. You know, it's, it's easy to hear this story and be outraged 
by the hypocrisy of the servant. How could this servant who experienced this forgiveness refuse to give it to somebody else? How could a person be so harsh and unforgiving? And yet, this is something that we all do. This is something that we all struggle with. This is a universal feeling and experience. Uh, Many of us have experienced hurt and pain. We've been wronged. We've been wounded. And so often, we want to hold on to that. And we don't want to forgive others for the ways that they have harmed us and hurt us and caused us pain. The theologian Henry Nouwen once wrote, Forgiveness is the name of love practiced among people who love poorly. The hard truth is that all people love poorly. We need to forgive and be forgiven every day, every hour, increasingly. That is a great work of love among the fellowship of the weak that is the human family. We have to ask ourselves, are we guilty of doing that same thing that the servant did in this story? There are so many Christians who have been forgiven by God. All of us have been forgiven by God, and yet we refuse to forgive others. As Christians, we believe that God has paid the ultimate price for our sins. God has forgiven us, and yet... There are times when we refuse to forgive others. You know, no wonder people sometimes think that we Christians are hypocrites, right? But like the servant in this parable who is forgiven a huge debt, but is unwilling to forgive a small one, God has forgiven God's people of a huge debt. And so often we Christians are unwilling to forgive others of their debts. Jesus utters a phrase in the Lord's Prayer that says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Think about that statement for a minute. Do we really mean that? You know, why do we have such a hard time forgiving other people? And I think part of the reason is because we actually have a faulty idea of what forgiveness really is. We have this idea in our heads of what we think it is. And so I want to take a minute and just talk a little bit about what forgiveness is, but also talk about what forgiveness is not and address some of those misconceptions. I really like uh, the theologian Rob Bell. He talks a lot about this idea of forgiveness, and I want to share um, some of his, his framework on this because I think it's really good stuff. He starts out, he talks about, you know, first of all, forgiveness is not condoning the act or saying what someone did to you was okay. And I think that's really important for us that when we are hurt, when we've been hurt, um, to acknowledge that, that it's wrong, that it hurt, and that there's a deep pain there. And the truth is what that person did was not okay. And when you forgive them, that doesn't mean that you are excusing them of for what they did. In other words, forgiving is not condoning. And forgiveness is not waiting around for someone who has harmed you to come up to you and to confess and apologize for what they did. Um, the chances are that's probably not going to happen, unfortunately. Um, if you're waiting around for somebody that has harmed you to come and apologize to you, Maybe you need to realize that that day may never come. And maybe you're holding on to it, waiting for that person to come and, and make this confession and ask for an apo- or offer an apology and ask for forgiveness. And you're just holding on to that, but it's, it's just hurting you. So waiting for an apology might not be the best option. Um, you might be holding on to that bitterness and that sense for justice Um, or revenge, and and you might never let that go if you're waiting around for somebody to come and apologize first. Uh, Forgiveness is also not eliminating the consequences or preventing justice from taking place. So, in other words, you can forgive somebody, but there also may still be some severe consequences for what took place. There may be legal or relational or financial Uh, consequences to their actions. Forgiving somebody does not mean that there are just all of a sudden no longer consequences for their actions. Um, It doesn't mean that they get off scot-free. 
And forgiveness also is not forgetting what happened. Sometimes it's remembering what has happened and moving on in a different way. So it is possible to forgive and move on, but forgiving is not necessarily forgetting. Sometimes forgiving is remembering. Somebody you have to sometimes you have to remember what happened to you so that you can set up some healthy boundaries around yourself to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Finally, forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. Sometimes things just cannot go back to the way they used to be, the good old days. Um, Forgiving does not necessarily mean that things will just all of a sudden go back to normal. Um, This is because reconciliation takes two healthy people who have committed to a relationship to do the work, to make it work, um, And that's something that doesn't always take place. Uh, Forgiveness is different than reconciliation. So you might get to a point in your life where you forgive somebody and you truly love them, you truly wish what is the best for them, but you may not ever be around them again. You might forgive them, but you might not reconcile the relationship And that's okay, uh, because forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Obviously, we always hope for reconciliation, but sometimes that just doesn't work. It's not an option. So it's important to recognize that forgiveness and reconciliation are two very different things. So now that we've talked kind of about what forgiveness is not, I want to talk about what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is intimate. It's personal. So I've heard people say, if you think of a, some, of a person that has harmed you and you have a hard time talking about that person or you maybe have a hard time praying for that person or a hard time wishing that person well or maybe something good happens in their life and you just can't find it in yourself to kind of be happy for them, Well, that's a good indicator that maybe there's some resentment there. Maybe you haven't been able to forgive them yet. Maybe you can't even say their name or talk about them or, um, you know, be able to think about them without having some of these harsh feelings come up. That could be an indicator that you haven't really moved on, that you haven't really forgiven them. So forgiveness is very personal. It, it really has to do with our relationships with others and the ways that we think about others. It's a personal, intimate relationship, oftentimes with somebody that we are close to or used to be close to. Um, and that's why it can be painful and hard to forgive somebody because th- there's an intimate, uh, personal thing going on there. So forgiveness is very personal. Also, uh, forgiveness is a process. I think this is so important because forgiveness doesn't just happen overnight. Sometimes it can, <laughs> but for for a lot of us and a lot of situations and circumstances, it takes some time. Um, it's totally normal for it to take some time, but realizing that you need to forgive somebody is the first step that you have to take in that very sometimes long process of forgiveness. And sometimes it's just taking it one day at a time, just taking that move toward forgiveness little by little, step by step. Um, It's a process. It takes time. It takes practice. And so um, kind of you have to develop that forgiveness in your heart. And forgiveness means also that you don't let others hold power over you. Forgiveness means that you don't let others hold power over you. When you haven't forgiven someone, that person has a tremendous amount of power over you. When we forgive, we let that go. That person no longer has any power over us. Um, It doesn't change our mood, doesn't change our attitude. We're able to let go of our grudges, let go of those things that are really only affecting us in a negative way. It never hurts the person who has hurt us. It only harms us when we hold those grudges. 
And I think forgiveness also calls us to realize our own faults and mistakes. It starts with realizing that we're not perfect ourselves. We have made mistakes. Uh, Reverend Adam Hamilton writes, The process of forgiveness begins with our awareness and understanding of sin. For if we are not aware of our sin, we go on living self-absorbed lives while hurting others. So forgiveness means understanding how we aren't perfect. It begins with understanding our need for grace and forgiveness. And only then will we be able to offer that same grace and forgiveness to others. Friends, the truth is that sometimes we are the ones who have harmed others. We are the ones that have brought pain and suffering and hardship in other people's lives. And so maybe we need to recognize how we have made mistakes and how we need forgiveness. And we have an opportunity to go to those folks that we have harmed and hurt and apologize, confess our wrongdoings and our sins, and hopefully bring about reconciliation. But to offer ourselves and and to recognize how we are not perfect, how we have hurt others, how we have made mistakes. I think that's a very important role in not only forgiving others, but us ourselves seeking forgiveness for the ways that we have harmed others as well. I love the way that Marjorie Thompson describes forgiveness. She writes this, To forgive is to make a conscious choice to release the person who has wounded us from the sentence of our judgment, however justified that judgment may be. It represents a choice to leave behind our resentment and desire for retribution, however fair such punishment may seem. Forgiveness involves excusing persons from the punitive consequences they deserve because of their behavior. The behavior remains condemned, but the offender is released from its effects as far as the forgiver is concerned. Forgiveness means the power of the original wounds, power to hold us trapped, is broken. There's a great story of a pastor named Will Willman who preached a sermon on the topic of forgiveness. And after the church service, a woman approached Willeman at the front of a door of the church, and she looked at him and in this very angry tone said, Do you mean to tell me that Jesus expects me to forgive my abusive husband who made my life hell for 10 years until I finally got the courage to leave him? You're saying that I'm supposed to forgive him? And when Willeman heard this, he got nervous, and he defensively said, Well... You know, I only have you know 20 minutes for the sermon. I can't properly uh, qualify and nuance everything, but I do feel that, though I am deeply concerned about the problem of spousal abuse, I do feel that Jesus does tell us to forgive our enemies. And who is a greater enemy than your ex-husband? I, I do think that Jesus probably did mean for us to... She rose to her full height, and she said, Good, thank you, just checking. Willman went back to his office, and he heard the voice of God. And God said, Will, how dare you try to protect me from her? Who told you as a preacher to try to lessen the gap between her and the living gospel? Who told you that she couldn't handle the forgiveness that I was calling her to? You know, I I could spend this entire podcast talking about how you were probably justified in not forgiving certain people. I could help you come up with reasons why you are in the right and that person who has wronged you doesn't deserve your forgiveness. But if I did that, I would be doing you a huge disservice. We can think on that question, how often should I forgive someone? And perhaps we already know this answer because we know how much we have already been forgiven. There's an encounter that the disciples have at the end of the Gospels where they see the risen Christ after his crucifixion. And at first, uh, they look at him and they think that he's a ghost, but then Jesus shows them the scars on his hands and feet. He shows them the gash in his side. He shows them the wounds that he suffered on the cross. And isn't it interesting that the resurrected Christ still bears these wounds? You know, you would think that when Jesus came back from the dead, these scars would be completely gone, that they would disappear, but that's not what happens. Because those scars are there for a reason. 
Those scars are intertwined with the crucifixion and the resurrection. You can't have one without the other. Jesus went through death on a cross, and only then could Jesus be resurrected from the dead. And those marks on his hands, his feet, and his side tell us about who he is, what he has suffered, and the story of his redemption. An article from the New York Times talks about Jesus' wounds, and it explores the question, Do the prints of nails, the gash of the spear, reveal weakness and vulnerability? Wouldn't it be better to remove rather than memorialize the visible signs of an agonizing death? In response to that question, author Andy Crouch points out that the Latin word vulnerable means wound. He says if God is woundable, is God therefore vulnerable? The persistence of the scars show that the answer is unmistakably and eternally yes. Andy Crouch goes on to say, If a scar is a healed wound, a wound that the body has marvelously managed to rescue and restore, then in some way Christ's entire bodily form, having suffered the ultimate injury of death, but having been rescued and restored, is that of a scar. Perhaps our scars, which are so often a source of shame and regret, are the truest clues we have to the full form of our resurrection bodies. Many of us have deep wounds that we have been walking around with for a long time. Some of us have been hurt and wounded by the people around us. Some of us have done things to hurt and wound ourselves. And when we heal from those wounds, they don't just go away. They turn into scars. And our scars have stories. Our scars tell us about what we've been through. Our scars are a glimpse into who we are and what we have overcome. And the story of Jesus shows us that sometimes those wounds don't heal in this life. Sometimes those wounds go with us to the grave. But the good news is that those wounds can be turned into scars in the resurrection. We can be healed. They don't completely go away, but we find redemption all the same. As the Apostle Peter says, by his wounds we are healed. That's just like forgiveness. We don't forget or condone the ways in which we have been harmed, but it's an invitation to find redemption and healing. We still have the scars because they tell our story. Forgiveness is an opportunity to heal your wounds, and you can bear those scars.